Okay, there's a lot of words. Again, I'm just giving you some of the legalese on this for your record. Um, reasonable accommodation, this is under the ADA regulations, modifications or adjustments to either an application process or to the work environment. We will talk briefly at the end about accommodating applicants modifications or adjustments that enable the employee with a disability to enjoy equal benefits and privileges of employment. The ADA regulations state that reasonable accommodation may include, but is not limited to making existing facilities used by employees readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities and job restructuring, part-time modified work schedule, reassignment to a vacant position etc. The human rights law defines reasonable accommodation this way. Action taken which permit an employee, prospective employee or member with a disability or pregnancy related condition to perform in a reasonable manner the activities involved in the job or occupation sought or held and include and then list some examples. Just note that pregnancy related condition is thrown in here in the New York Human Rights Law. It's also a component of similar language in the New York City Human Rights Law. It's not specifically addressed in the ADA, but to the extent that a pregnancy related condition has something to do with the mother's health or physical condition, um, disability would probably encompass it anyway. So there's uh, sort of a, a scope of protections under federal laws for pregnancy related conditions, even though it's not specifically stated in the ADA. But for our purposes today, we're not going to have any reason to really separate a pregnancy related condition from a disability. But there is the sensitivity to not specifically wanting to refer to all pregnancy related conditions as disabilities per se, because of course, many people um, think very positively of pregnancy related conditions, even if they would prefer not to have disabilities. So again, more examples of accommodation just from the human rights law regulations. Here, the Human rights law does note that reasonable accommodation does not include, among other things, providing for personal care needs um, and providing non-work related aids, such as personal hearing aids or wheelchairs, which are the employee's own responsibility. So for example, employee who needs to take a certain type of medication for their health, they might need that to be able to perform their job along with, you know, living their life generally, but it's not going to become in any but the most um, unlikely and unusual circumstances, the employer's obligation to pay for that medication. Again, under these laws, obviously if you have insurance plans in place, they might dictate what you're paying for, but that's not an accommodation. Even though, like I said, it might very well be necessary that they have that medication to be able to perform their job. The human rights law has some reasonableness factors. You know, all of this really is going to play in when determining whether an accommodation is available, viable and required. Technically speaking, again, there's going to be the issue of whether the accommodation is reasonable in the first place. And then the second analysis as to whether, albeit a reasonable accommodation, uh, nonetheless create too much of an undue hardship on the employer to require them to make the accommodation. The reasonableness factors go into basically whether the accommodation would actually work and enable the person to perform the essential functions of the job. The convenience of the accommodation including its comparative convenience compared to other possible accommodations and the hardships, costs, or problems it will cause the employer. So basically by definition, whether an accommodation is reasonable includes an analysis as to whether the accommodation provides an undue hardship. 
So it's, you know, it's kind of academic to debate whether the accommodation is reasonable and nonetheless causes an undue hardship. The overall idea is does the accommodation cause an undue hardship to the employer? But for example, whether it causes an undue hardship or not, an accommodation wouldn't necessarily be reasonable if it didn't in fact allow the employee to perform the job. So to get more practical than all those long word, uh, phrases and terms ripped out of the laws and regulations, tangible types of accommodations include physical equipment, in the workplace, ramps or special desks or chairs, um, just other equipment that could be used to enable someone to perform a job that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Job restructuring, leave, modified or part-time schedules, they kind of lump all of those um, in a sense because you know, a part-time schedule could sort of be leave if it means you're gonna work a couple days a week instead of full-time, which is also a modified schedule. On the other hand, a modified schedule could include a scenario where the employee is still going to work the full number of hours, say 40 hours in a week, but be allowed to do it in four 10-hour days versus five eight-hour days because they need to travel one day of the week to receive medical treatment. job restructuring could encompass some of those things where it could entail actually changing the way the job is performed. It could mean moving someone to a different part of the facility. Um, but again, it wouldn't always mean that you would have to do that. It would depend on what's an undue hardship. Modified workplace, that could be something equipment-based, installing ramps or changing the physical layout of an employee's workspace but it could also be a change in work rules, for example, um, prohibiting employees from wearing perfumes or other scented products because it aggravates employees' allergies or other um, triggers to you know, their mental or physical well-being. And then reassignment, this, recognizes that there might be accommodation obligations to try to reassign someone who can't perform the essential functions of one job to another position. This would require in the first place that another position be vacant and that the employee needing accommodation is qualified for that job. So these laws clearly state that employees, or I'm sorry, employers don't have to create new positions for employees with disabilities as accommodations. Nonetheless, as a practical matter, there are many employers who do in fact end up creating new positions to accommodate employees for various reasons. But again, that's typically not a legal requirement. And I just add other to this list because there's no limitation on the things that could qualify as accommodations. Um, and if there is something else that doesn't fit into one of these other six categories listed above, that doesn't mean that it would not qualify as an accommodation if it is reasonable and would enable someone to perform the essential functions of their job.